Joining us now for an exclusive interview is Dallas Federal Reserve President Robert Kaplan. President Kaplan, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Good to see you, Sarah. You have really led this discussion lately around tapering. You're, you're actually talking about tapering, not just talking about talking about tapering. Do you still think that's appropriate, given we've seen now a streak of economic data misses, including the last jobs report? Uh, I, I think this, uh, this recovery is going to be a little bit unusual and in fits and starts because of these supply issues that we're seeing, which I think for us helps explain some of these uh, data releases. But I think we're in a recovery. We're moving toward weathering the pandemic. I think we're going to be making progress toward full employment and price stability. And, and I've said, based on that, sooner rather than later, I think it would be wise to start uh, talking about uh, moderating some of these asset purchases that we put in place during the crisis, but I think uh, maybe uh, the efficacy of these versus the side effects, I think that balance is changing as we're emerging from the crisis and making progress. Uh, I guess for lack of a better analogy, I've said it, I think it'd be wise sooner rather than later to begin gently taking our foot off the accelerator so we can avoid and reduce the probability of having to apply the brakes down the road. So, so what sort of negative consequences are you worried about, about if, if you were to take too long? How has the calculus changed for you? So uh, I, I'm, I'm, we're watching very carefully. I'm watching very carefully uh, in the financial markets, uh, keeping our eye on excess risk taking, understanding that when uh, rates are at zero and we're also buying these asset purchases, it creates a lot of liquidity and, uh, and people are going out the risk curve. But in particular, we're watching the housing market where uh, single family home levels are historically elevated. But I think more than that, uh, we're seeing single families uh, competing with private investors who are also buying homes uh, fully furnished to rent. Uh, and, and I think, uh, I, I think it's, our, it's my own view that at this stage, as opposed to a year ago, these mortgage purchases, for example, might be having some unintended consequences and side effects, which I think we need to weigh against the efficacy. And so I think some restraint and moderation as uh, we move toward weathering this pandemic, I, I think would be uh, useful in, in, in mitigating some of these excesses and imbalances. Do, do you think you're on your own with that sort of perspective? Uh, certainly when we hear Chair Powell and his public appearances and public comments, he, he seems not to share any of those uh, concerns at all. So uh, I guess I'll, 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 I won't comment on, on the group or where we are. We obviously will have a meeting here in mid-June. We will, as we always do, share our views. I think one of the great things about Chair Powell and his leadership is he encourages us encourages me to express, express my views, to debate, to disagree. And out of that process, I think we, we'll make better decisions. And so I'm confident that we'll have a good process and we'll each bring to that what we're seeing uh, and, uh, and de debate and, uh, and disagree and come up with appropriate policy. Very civilized <laughs> response and, and discussion around the Fed table. So you, you mentioned you're watching asset bubbles, you're watching the housing market. What about inflation overall, President Kaplan? Are you worried that the economy is overheating and the Fed could get behind the would be behind the curve if it didn't? So move I think we, than later? we've got we've got cross currents we're observing as it relates to inflation. Uh, you've got the cyclical elements of it that not only have to do with the normal business cycle, but the reopening which is, uh, is understandable that as we reopen, you're going to see price pressures, and we're seeing that. But we also have a number of structural elements. You see uh, CapEx behavior changing in a number of raw materials industries. Uh, we're, we're seeing, uh, uh, in examples, the semiconductor industry has got substantial CapEx that needs to be spent. Uh, and against that, You've got some other trends like more infrastructure spending coming, coming, which will increase demand, particularly for some of these materials. Uh, you've got the greening of the economy, which will change supply and demand. And on the labor side, 
uh, we've, we've been talking for years about the aging of the workforce. Uh, and, you know, we think uh, since February of 2020, two and a half million workers have self-identified as retired. Another million and a half are women with children who are home with their kids. And so I think some of these supply demand issues uh, may, uh, may be somewhat persistent here. And so my job is not to put a label on it or to know exactly the outcome, but it is to be open to a range of outcomes and manage the risk, understanding our commitment is to anchor inflation expectations at 2%. And, and this is why from a risk management point of view, as it relates to this, I, I think, uh, again, taking the foot off the accelerator here uh, uh, very gently may help uh, be a factor in managing uh, these risks. So, so interesting. And I just want to use a, a quote uh, that came today from the Bank of England's chief economist, Andy Haldane. He said, quote, the situation we need to avoid like the plague is one where inflation expectations are just before we do or where we wait for positive proof that effects on inflation are not transitory before acting. And, and the reason I bring that up, I mean, it follows your previous answer as well, is how is it that we're in a case, a uh, state of play, where the chief economist of a, another very credible central bank is saying they've got to avoid that situation like the plague, but the kind of consensus view of the Fed seems to be, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait, we have to have endless proof for many months before we consider tapering. I mean, again, do you have quite a lot of clashes with your colleagues on this point of view? So you got you to remember that going to pre-pandemic, we went for years in the United States where we were not hitting our 2% inflation target, even with a very tight labor market. And one of the trends that's, that, that was occurred then and is still with us is technology, technology-enabled disruption, limiting the pricing power of business. So coming out of this pandemic, I think we've got some paradigm shifts. And it's not surprising that it's a challenge to understand these shifts. And as we do that, uh, there's no textbook for this. You don't want to be so preemptive that you choke off the recovery. But on the other hand, you don't want to be so reactive that you're late and you're behind the curve. And But that's the balance. It's not surprising in this type of paradigm shift uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic that we're, we're struggling to find that balance. And I think that's to be expected. President Kaplan, there's word today that the Biden administration is calling for $6 trillion in spending, running deficits north of $1.3 trillion every year for the next several years. I mean, that we're going to need a lot of buyers. And foreigners have slowed their buyers lately. You're talking about tapering. Who, who's going to buy all those treasuries to finance that debt? So um, spent a lot of time talking to contacts uh, in the business sector, in the financial sector. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of attractiveness around the world uh, uh, for the U.S. dollar and for the U.S. treasuries. And also you've got an aging society, a uh, substantial amount of pension fund money. So I, I think this is why, uh, and Jay Powell has said this, we need to uh, telegraph well in advance our intentions, give the market plenty of notice, and, and do it. Uh, I, I think we should be doing this in a, when we do start to adjust purchases, do it in a gradual way. Uh, but, but I think uh, the, 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 there's going to be, I, I personally think there's going to be a, a strong bid for the U.S. Treasury. Uh, but, but I also realize that the market is going to have to find its level. And I've said many times, I think, on this program, uh, it wouldn't surprise me. and I think it might even be healthy to see the 10 year drift upward uh, from here. Pre pandemic, we forget already the 10 year was at one and three quarters to two percent. And so I, I think uh, I think there's a point when you emerge from the crisis. I, I would I, I think reducing our imprint on these markets will be healthy. And yes, the markets will have to find their natural level. What about labor shortages? We've heard plenty from, from various guests on our show uh, about uh, the shortages that people are, are experiencing. Is that something uh, that, that concerns you? And if, if we do see wages go up because of that reason, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, so what, here's what we're saying, first of all. So I mentioned, uh, if you look at the employment to population ratio in February of 2020, 
it was about over 3% or 300 basis points higher than it is today. So about eight and a half million workers. Our analysis though at the Dallas Fed, and we just put out a paper this morning to talk about this. Uh, as I said earlier, about two and a half million of that eight and a half million are people that have now self-identified as retired. Some of them will likely come back in, but it's hard to know how many. A million and a half are women with children. Uh, and then and then you've got the issue for, the, for another uh, four million plus of uh, the impact of unemployment benefits. So the, the labor force we think is tighter today than the headline employment numbers would suggest. Uh, and yeah, I think you're seeing it actually in firming wage numbers, both in uh, low skilled, uh, but also I think you're gonna see it in skilled workers. And I do worry, I hear from uh, high school superintendents, or principals, as well as junior college superintendents, uh, High schools are telling me that senior classes are smaller. A lot of their students have dropped out to work, but it's important that they get back and get their GED because they're gonna to need to go for skill training. They need a GED to do that. And we're hearing from junior colleges that skills training enrollment is down substantially. So we've got our work cut out for us to get people back in the workforce, but to get people also back in skills training. And so, I, yeah, I think you'll see some impact on wages uh, could it be even welcome? Yes, I think it could be, but but I think we've got to get this pipeline moving. This is this is why I talk a lot in this job about uh, improving skills training, beefing it up, but also improving the whole education ecosystem, starting with early childhood literacy. We need to improve the education pipeline. Robert Kaplan, thank you so much for joining us. The hawk on the Fed. Did you ever think you'd be the most hawkish member of the Fed? Well, no, in, in 18 and 19, you remember, I was calling for a pause at the end of 18, and in 19, I was dovish calling for uh, rate, rate decreases. So I, I, I think you adapt to the reality. You're not a and these labels, no, these labels, I'd call myself a centrist or a moderate, and I probably, my guess over time, that's, that's probably going to be more accurate. Robert Kaplan, thank you very much for sharing your views, president of the Dallas Fed.